Hi, we're starting this, but I'm going to wait a couple of minutes because we're a little bit early. Um, so I'll wait till 7 to actually start. Somebody come in on your email, Roger. Um, yeah, yep. Uh, Landis Gable, so you, we can see him. Oh, oh, so Landis, I sent you a Hi, link. I sent you a link yesterday to a better uh, to the participants. You came in on the speakers. Uh, oh, let me get off of here quickly yeah. then, and I'll Thanks. go. <laughs> Bye. All right. Bye. See, I'll see you in a few. Okay. There's two Rogers. Two of me or two just well, another Well, it, ca it came up with your name. He came oh. up with your name. Oh, okay. That's because I sent the original link. That, uh, but then I sent right. him the revised link. Okay, it's 7 o'clock, so we'll get started. Welcome to the Main Chapter Wednesday webinar. My name is Cindy Caverly, Chair of the Main Chapter, and I'll be your host tonight. We're grateful that Roger Ripmaster has volunteered to present this webinar focusing on building a healthy backyard wow. ecosystem with native plants and insects. Before we start, I'd like to go through a little housekeeping. Um, your mics should be muted and I think they are automatically, but you should check to be sure. Um, since this is a webinar, I don't think we can hear you, but just in case. Roger would like to take questions as they come up during the presentation. So if you have a question, use the raise hand icon on the bottom of your screen and Roger will answer as he's able. I don't think either one of us has used that raise hand um, feature before. So uh, hopefully it will work out. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the AMC Maine YouTube channel, along with all our webinars and online workshops. I'll put the link in the chat bar and you can also check our Facebook page. Roger Rittmaster is a retired endocrinologist and an avid nature photographer. He moved to Maine nine years ago to pursue his hobbies of natural history, woodworking and tennis. Shortly after moving to Maine, he authored the book, Butterflies Up Close, a guide to butterfly photography. Roger is a Maine master naturalist, former chair of the Camden Conservation Commission, and serves on the board of the Coastal Mountains Land Trust. When asked about what areas of natural history interest him the most, he replies, anything with DNA. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Roger. Enjoy. Thank, thank you, Cindy. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's nice to see all of you, or actually I can't see all of you. Uh, I hope that if you have questions, the raised hand uh, icon will work. Um, if not, hopefully Cindy will figure out a way that we can actually uh, do your questions. Um, as uh, Cindy mentioned in her introduction of me, uh, uh, I'm not a specialist. I'm a generalist in terms of my interest in natural history. So I know uh, a little bit about a whole lot of things, but uh, uh, insects and plants are, are my hobbies. And so that's what I'll be talking to you today. What I wanna do is there's really three things I want you to get out of this. One is, uh, first of all, I wanna awe you with the, just the diversity of plants and insects that inhabit fields near you, if not in your backyard. Uh, secondly, is just highlight the importance of co-evolution of plants and insects because without this uh, there is no balance and if you take a an insect or a plant that's invasive it disrupts that balance uh, and, and can take over a field. And, and finally uh, at the end I'll be talking about well how if I wanted to establish a, a, a field in my uh, on my property or nearby that's a healthy ecosystem how do I go about doing that? So I'm um, trying to change to my next slide and it's not working. There we go. So th this is my backyard in Camden, Maine on, on the uh, Muscadabit River. Uh, before we moved here, the previous owner had bishhogged this field, which is a little less than an acre. Uh, 
uh, every fall, late in the fall. And that was ideal because it allowed uh, the native plants such as asters and goldenrods to set seed. Um, and it kept trees out because fields aren't normal in, in, in Maine. They all turned to forests eventually. So if you want a field, you have to maintain it. Uh, I put in a water garden that you can see on the left to attract some uh, species that won't breed in, in anything that has fish in it, um, such as spotted salamanders and wood frogs and, and spring peepers. And then every year I choose a different invasive to go attack. Um, and that's why there's a uh, hole at the bottom right here where there's a, a the former owner planted gout weed, which is a horrible invasive, and I'm trying to get rid of it. Anyhow, I want to start with the story of a Baltimore checker spot. This is a beautiful butterfly. It's native to Maine, but uncommonly seen. It requires a wet meadow, and that meadow must have turtle head in it. So these are turtle heads, and I happen to have turtle heads in, in the, my backyard, which is a meadow, uh, but doesn't look anything like this. They're pretty scrawny plants, and I told a uh, horticulturalist uh, what I was doing and wanting to raise these Baltimore checker spots and he was so excited he sent me 50 seedlings of turtle head which I planted in my backyard. Then a friend of a friend gave me some Baltimore checker spot eggs and so these he had too many in his yard because he raised Baltimore checker spots. He cuts off some leaves, uh, taped them to a piece of wax paper and uh, brought them up to me in Maine. I made a cigar out of each of those, uh, put them over a turtle head plant, the leaf, and said, okay, here we go. <laughs> uh, the next day, this guy appeared eating all the, eating as many eggs as he could. And this is a, a European amber snail. It's um, an invasive snail uh, from Europe. Uh, present on the main coast and uh, some other places in the northeast, but it's the most common on the main coast. And it's a predator, it feeds on eggs. So I, I took uh, paint strainers and put them over each plant after picking these guys off. And they are all over my fields and, and, and they'll eat any kind of uh, insect egg. Uh, fortunately, something has gotten them because their population has crashed in the last couple of years in my yard, and I'm thankful for that. But anyhow, the eggs hatched and each caterpillar goes through an instar, which uh, goes through several instars. Because all insects have an exoskeleton and can't expand that, they must shed it when they're growing. So each of those shedded phases is called an instar. And these are third instar caterpillars of the Baltimore checker spot. And at that point in time, which is late July, early August, they climb to the top of the turtle head plant and form a web. And they remain in that web until the fall, late September. And then they migrate down into the soil where they overwinter. Uh, this was another predator that came in. This was a, uh, a predatorial stink bug. And what it does is it impales the, the caterpillars and uh, injects digestive juices and then sucks up the uh, innards of the caterpillar. I, I didn't mind these guys, you know, they have a right to live as well and there's plenty of caterpillars uh, around. Uh, but again, this is ecosystem. And you think about what would happen if, if there weren't any predators on these caterpillars, they just overrun and, and eventually uh, die off because they eat up all their host plants. So the following spring, and a couple of stars, I had adult ready to form, uh, to form pupa. And the interesting thing uh, about these is that the uh, caterpillars in their, when they come up in the spring can eat a whole bunch of plants. And this happens to be valerian, which is uh, uh, an exotic plant, but they also feed on ash and uh, uh, a type of viburnum uh, called arrowwood. And they form pupa, and this is one pupa. And I was really excited. I got, you know, I must have had hundreds of these in my field, although I couldn't find very many. And I waited two weeks, three weeks. This particular pupa uh, just turned gray, and the hole came, it was formed in it. And what it was, it was attacked by a parasitic, probably wasp. Um, 
And in fact, I saw no adults. So the next thing I did was uh, put up an enclosure uh, for the next year. And I got a bunch of adults. But once I opened the, the top off and let them out, they all flew away. They must have known something's wrong with this field. So I call this a glorious failure. I tried and failed. What killed the Baltimore checker spot caterpillars? What role do the caterpillars play in the ecosystem? What would happen if the caterpillars had no predators? Are caterpillars ever beneficial to their host plants? And are predators ever beneficial to their prey? And in the rest of this talk, hopefully I'll answer all these questions for you. Okay. So all of our energy starts with the sun. Without the sun, we wouldn't be here. But we actually can't use the sun's energy to make food directly. We have to rely on plants that photosynthesize and create uh, uh, sugars from the sun's energy. And those plants in turn get eaten by herbivorous insects and other herbivores, and we're herbivores as well. And if you're a vegetarian, you're a that's all you do. Um, but other times we rely on other herbivores, uh, like cows, uh, to uh, process the plants for us. Okay. So uh, plants are the primary energy producers, but to have a, a healthy ecosystem, you need more than just plants. And, and, and what this slide is showing is a field of hawkweed, and it happens to be a non-native hawkweed, and it's just totally dominating. So you say, oh, okay, this is just great for the, um, for the pollinators. Um, and actually, I started this talk uh, originally because I just didn't like the concept of promoting pollinators as the reason for native plants. Because you need more than pollinators, you need all those herbivores. Um, what will happen if you have a pure stand of anything is that the pollinators that pollinate those have to have things to eat all year long. And once these plants are no longer making flowers, if there's nothing else for them to feed on, they, they die off themselves. And that's why when we have our monocultures of blueberry fields, we have to bring in honeybees to pollinate them. Uh, because when those blueberry flowers are no longer in bloom, there's nothing left for pollinators to eat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what is this? Now, normally I'm giving this talk live. Um, so do you know what this ornamental tree is um, and how many native caterpillars use this? Well, it's a ginkgo tree. Um, and then I, I got this list off the web uh, for uh, state of Maine. Uh, how many caterpillars use various plants? And the willow is the winner with 434 different caterpillars found on willows. Oaks are right behind and birches and cherry trees and poplars are all uh, bountiful in terms of herbivorous insects and caterpillars. And then you get down to ginkgo at the bottom and zero. A ginkgo plant is a, a desert uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, what will what it provides to the environment. And I can proudly say I have each of these plants on my property, at least one representative from each of these genuses. Uh, and I've photographed over 400 species of moths on my property. Uh, and I can say that those are only moths that are attracted to, uh, to lights. Uh, and there's probably another four um, that I haven't seen yet. Okay, so now what I want to do is just talk about some of the herbivores that exist in any field and exist in your backyard if to grow in more than grass. So this is a moth, the Dexels dentana, dentana uh, which I found on a high bush blueberry that I planted. Um, it was uh, in early September and they are gregarious feeders. And they strip my high bush blueberry plant in a, a, over a period of about 10 days. And I said, okay, that's fine. And in fact, they've co-evolved with high bush blueberries. So that's what they eat. And you say, oh, but they're just gonna uh, 
eradicate the high bush blueberries. Well, that's not true because this is happening in September. And even though they defoliated my high bush blueberry, the next spring it produced a new crop of leaves and an abundant crop of blueberries. So again, because these have co-evolved, we know that each species can handle uh, the other. And then you might say, okay, is the caterpillar doing anything good for the plant or is it just taking from that plant? Yeah. What happens is once you get an herbivore starting to eat a plant, that plant develops defenses. And usually it's successful in warding off uh, uh, the majority of herbivores. But if it fails, in this case, it still wins because now it has these chemicals in it that will prevent eating from a lot of different caterpillars. Uh, and in fact, most caterpillars are specific, not all, but most are specific to an individual species, like the Drexels datana, which feeds on highbush blueberries. All right, other uh, herbivores, grasshoppers, katydids, crickets. The difference between a katydid and a grasshopper is pretty Grasshoppers have short antennas. They're called horns. Um, uh, you know that? And you can see it right here. I don't know if you can see my, uh, yeah, you probably can see my pointer. Where it's katydids have these long antennas that usually are longer than their bodies. Katydids are really neat. And in many cultures, both grasshoppers and katydids are a source of protein. Um, so they're herbivores and they're directly used as food for many different cultures. Okay, we, colloquially we refer to bugs as uh, anything that, any insect or insect-like creature like spiders and we call them all bugs. But they're actually true bugs. Uh, and a true animal uh, like the one in the lower left, the small milkweed bug. And these are distinguished by having a stiff, proximal portion of its wing, the base of its wing, and a membranous outer portion, which you really can't tell here, but what these, when they overlap, lap, they form an X. So if you see a bug uh, or an insect that has an X on its back, that's a true bug um, in the uh, order Heteroptera. Now this is a beetle up top, a milkweed beetle, I'm losing my pointer, and beetles, you can tell because they have wing covers called elytra, and they come together in the middle and form a line. So if you see a bug with a line down the middle, okay. see a beetle. Yeah. now the other thing you might notice say, hey, these look pretty similar, and they both are feed on milkweeds, as do monarch caterpillars, um, which are orange and black, as are monarchs. So what is it? What's going on? Well, milkweeds have toxins in them, uh, cardiac glycosides like uh, digoxin that we used to use in, in heart failure. Um, and these insects have found a way to detoxify those poisons where many other insects can't detoxify them. Now, if they start looking like each other, there's an advantage. And the advantage is this. The bright orange and black warn predators such as birds saying, you remember the last time you tried to eat me and I tasted terrible? Don't forget that. And it's called aposematic coloration, this warning colors. Uh, the, uh, so if you see an insect, it's really bright and obvious, you can bet it's toxic. Um, and then they look like each other because they take advantage of uh, security and numbers. There's Lots of them around, there's more if they have more species look the same. And that's why you have so many orange and black butterflies because they all look like monarchs, which are equally toxic because they feed on milkweeds, the caterpillars do. Okay, so let's go on to one other thing about bugs. Um, this on the right is the leaf-footed bug. Above is the nymph, below is the adult. And there's a generalization with all insects if you see an insect without wings, it's likely a nymph. And the adults have wings, you can see right here, the nymph does not. Otherwise, sometimes they look very much the same. Um, another great example is grasshoppers. If you um, 
if you see grasshoppers on your lawn in June or early July, they're jumping, but they're not flying. Where if you see them in August, they can fly. They've got their wings, they're adults. Beetles are some of my favorites. And I wanna just tell you again, some of these stories uh, that revolve around certain uh, insects. The goldenrod leaf miner, I took this picture in my yard. Um, the female, which is below, a laser eggs and poop all of them <laughs> as a defense uh, for her eggs. Um, and then uh, the larvae that develop out of the eggs migrate into the interior of uh, goldenrods and feed on the inside of goldenrods before they pupate. And then they fall to the ground, eventually become adults. Um, in the Midwest, tall goldenrod can take over a prairie so much so that nothing else will grow there. If the goldenrod leaf miner is there, it controls that, it eats up a lot of the leaves, allows light to get into the forest or into the prairie and allows succession of that prairie, things that won't tolerate shades like seed, tree seedlings will now grow because of this insect. So that dynamic is important in, su in succession in the Midwest. This is another herbivore. Uh, these are my favorite beetles. Uh, uh, they're uh, weevils, and they have long snouts like an elephant. They're usually brightly colored, um, and they're just cool little insects. Um, the, on the bottom is a wood boring insect. So, wood boring insects feed on dead and dying trees and help turn over nitrogen and decompose things. Of course, some of them uh, are harmful. Uh, this one is often mistaken for an emerald ash borer, which of course kills all the ash trees around, uh, but this one is a native uh, uh, wood boring in, uh, beetle. And now we're going to go small. So all of these are um, less than a half a, 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 a centimeter. If you really want to see the most in, in a field or uh, and actually in trees, get some close focusing binoculars and get a hand lens. Now, if you see a plant and you see a bunch of ants on the stem of that plant, you could be one of two things in that colony of ants. Uh, one of these tree hoppers, tree hoppers you can recognize by this outgrowth here on the part of the animal. This is his, his head, so to speak, and this is his tail. This part's called a pronotum, and it has a, a or some kind of protrusion. No one knows why, but almost all tree hoppers have this, and they become, become quite dramatic in the, uh, in the tropics. But what, what's happening here? Well, these ants are protecting these tree hoppers. If anything tries to attack them, uh, they will uh, defend those tree hoppers. The tree hoppers, in turn, are feeding on this plant. But in order to get enough protein out of the juice of the plant, they have to consume a whole lot of liquid excrete it as a sugary compound that the ants just love. So this is just a perfect symbiosis where the tree hopper is protected by the ants and has given the ants the, the honeydew that it, it feeds on to help its colony. If you look small again, you'll see these really colorful leaf hoppers. Sometimes they're just pure green, but lots of times they're colored like this. Um, and, and they're part of the whole ecosystem as well. A lot of things, small things, eat them. Um, they also carry plant pathogens, so they can also cause disease in plants as well. And then uh, there are aphids. And we always think of aphids are, are, are really bad. But most aphids actually are pretty harmless to plants, not always. Um, I'm just going to give you an example of a complex life history of an aphid. Uh, the woolly alder aphid starts its life as an egg on a, a red or silver maple and uh, uh, grows and, and when it reproduces, it reproduces parthogenetically, meaning it's they're only females. Um, but eventually, come oh, the end of June, early July, the colony starts producing winged adult adults. And those wings fly to alders and then they feed on an alder tree. And, and you can see these in July, it looks like tufts of cotton floating through the air. Well, it's really an aphid. It's on its wings 
um, flying, looking for a, an alder tree. They land on the alders uh, uh, and then reproduce uh, again parthogenetically, I think. And just to show you this uh, as another aphid, um, and before I go there, then they, in the fall they fly back to the red maples uh, as winged male and female adults mate lay eggs on the uh, maple tree and start the cycle again. For the oleander aphid that feeds on milkweeds, there's no males ever seen in the wild. None have ever been seen. They reproduce parthogenetically. Uh, in the fall, they form winged adults um, to fly off, or if the concentration gets too high, you'll see winged adults. But these are all babies that are born live from these females, and these are all females. Insects are, are, are really fascinating. The other thing that you'll see just really commonly if you look is leaf miners. And there are four orders of, of insects that form leaf mines, moths, flies, beetles, and sawflies, which are actually in the uh, same order as uh, of bees and wasps and ants. Um, if you have jewelweed in your yard, you'll definitely see the jewelweed leaf miner. And that's produced by this moth here. Um, excuse me. <laughs> I'm sorry, the jewelweed's on the bottom and the, the, uh, a fly is what uh, makes that leaf mine right here. On the top is a button bush and that's a moth that makes that leaf mine. And if you know the, the species and have a photograph of the mine, an expert can say, okay, this is what's making that mine. They're all characteristic. And the same with galls. So lots of things for galls, midges, which are a type of fly, wasps, mites, which are like little spiders, tiny spiders. So uh, the, uh, the goldenrod gall midge, that's a little fly that makes those. You can see that on some goldenrods in the fall. There's the cherry finger gall mite, which forms on black cherry trees. One of the neatest ones, is the spiny rose gall wasp. Why is that so neat? It's on native roses. Um, it is formed by a wasp, but there's about 10 other species that prey on that wasp and will instead will inject their eggs into the wasp that's growing in there, and instead another species of wasp comes out. Uh, so there's a whole ecosystem that devolves around the spiny rose gall wasp. And then this is a sumac gall aphid, and it has a similar life history to other aphids in that in the fall, winged females are produced that, that fly to moss. Actually, it's winged females. Yeah, it is winged females. They start reproducing in the, in the mosses, uh, eventually form males and females, which lay eggs in the spring. Um, the females are born, uh, form galls in the sumac tree, and then reproduce inside those galls parthogenetically, only females. And this just is a list of uh, all the species of, uh, of parasitoids. Uh, parasitoids are animals that eventually kill their host um, and then feed on the, the wasp that uh, forms the spiny rose gall. Okay, so those are all the good guys. Um, now we go to the predators. Uh, and the parasitoids. Of course, the, the predators are what we we uh, usually have a diverse environment for. It's the birds, uh, and they're the predators in chief. So <clears throat> this is a, a common yellow throat with a damselfly in its mouth. Um, all birds feed on insects. Even the seed eaters have to feed insects to the young. Uh, even if they can eat seeds themselves, the young can't. So they need to have insects and the more diverse the ecosystem, the more birds you'll have. Dragonflies and damselflies, I put this on here, I want people to be able to recognize things in their field. Uh, they're really pretty easy to tell apart. And a dragonfly, first of all, dragonflies and damselflies all start in water. This is the exuvia, it's the shed skin of this guy who crawled out in July and said, okay, I'm ready to become an adult. Uh, the adult had already formed inside um, and it's drying its wings. Except for when it's drying its wings, all dragonflies land with their wings apart. 
So if you see a dragonfly or damselfly with its wings apart, it's probably a dragonfly. There are damselflies, a few damselflies called spread wings that do land with their wings apart. Damselflies, both uh, when they mate, they form this wheel, but damselflies have a lot thinner abdomen and most of them land with their wings together, like right here and here. Um, another way to tell them apart is dragonflies have a thick base to their wings. Damselflies have a thin base. So mainly, if you look at them, you'll see long, narrow abdomen, it's a damselfly, stockier uh, insect, it's a dragonfly. Then there's the parasitoid wasps, and these are hugely important. Um, now, Charles Darwin said, I cannot persuade myself that a beneficial god would have created parasitic wasps with the intention of their feeding within the bodies of caterpillars. Um, <laughs> and there's nothing that could be actually farther from the truth. Um, yes, these things kill caterpillars, but if they didn't, that answers that question. You know, what would happen if the caterpillars had no predators? They would overwhelm their environment. Um, right here is, uh, no, let me just close that. Uh, right here is uh, a tomato hornworm, and these are Braconid wasp pupa. Um, so if you like uh, hornworms, as <laughs> only people like myself would, um, you might you say, oh, I could pick these off and save the caterpillar. No, these are the pupa. The caterpillar has already inoculated with the eggs, and now they've emerged and they're adults, and this caterpillar is, is near dead. Um, but if you, if you don't want caterpillars eating your tomato plants, then you like this wasp because it'll eventually, it controls the population of tomato hornworms. It does something else. When it injects an egg into a caterpillar, the caterpillar would have a defense, an immune system that would destroy that egg except for one thing. That egg comes coated with a virus uh, that live inside the wasp, and that virus then inactivates the immune system of the caterpillar. Uh, so again, just to show the complexity. But it even gets more complex because it turns out that sometimes the caterpillars survive this attack and Inside the DNA of, of some caterpillars is that DNA that came with the wasp egg. And it's been incorporated into the DNA of the caterpillar. And it turns out that that DNA prevents the invasion of another virus that is often lethal to caterpillars. So uh, it's an example of a parasitoid that usually kills its host, but in doing so, also has caused um, some resistance of hosts like that to another virus. Um, Chalcid wasps, again, are another common parasitoid. So I, I hope you're, what you're getting from this is some of the wonderful life histories that exist. Now I'm pressing my slide to move forward and it's not going forward. Um, Cindy, are you able to move these this forward? Is that probably not? It's probably me. No, it's all on your side. I can't. Okay, hold on one second. I'm gonna have to. My computer isn't frozen. Um, so if anybody, there we go. Okay, and then there are a bunch of flies. I'm not gonna go into these in detail, but if you look on uh, the adult flies, um, all are all of these flies um, are pollinators and important pollinators, but their larvae all feed on various other things like caterpillars or other flies or uh, um, uh, different larvae. Now, uh, two years ago, I took a course from Charlie Eisenman, the guy who took this photo. Charlie wrote a book called uh, Sign, uh, tracks and signs of insects. And this guy is an encyclopedia of that. And he posted this leaf. And what he said is, okay, this is a hairy honeysuckle leaf in Vermont where he lives. And this is the leaf mine of the, uh, of, um, the, uh, of the fly uh, that makes it. It's called a, um, 
uh, it's a all a grum is a fly. But he saw here that here was the cocoon of a braconid wasp. And here are the remains of that fly larva. So this wasp had parasitized this fly. And Charlie raises all the, um, the novel uh, leaf miners he can find. And uh, what happened was when he raised this, it wasn't a braconid wasp, a chalcid wasp came out of this leaf. So that chalcid wasp had parasitized the braconid wasp, which had parasitized the fly. And only Charlie would be able to interpret all this. He's an amazing guy. He's written a, an online book you can get from him, a, a PDF, I think it's like 1,500 pages on leaf miners. And then there's the pollinators, and I'll just go through these quickly, bees and wasps um, that uh, uh, prey on other animals like spiders for their, for their, to raise their larvae. Um, uh, in the case of the, the digger wasp, uh, but act as pollinators as well. And of course, butterflies and moths, and uh, uh, these are all in the backyard. On the lower right, well, you probably recognize, this is a monarch. Uh, this is a peck skipper. It looks like a moth to most people, but it's a, a butterfly. Uh, this is oh, uh, a fritillary. Um, and this is a clear wing moth, a hummingbird clear wing uh, that looks like a hummingbird, acts like a hummingbird, but so a moth. You can differentiate moths from butterflies in that butterflies all have either hooked wings, uh, antenna tips, or clubs on their antenna tips. Obviously, you usually often have to have a photograph, but not always with my close up binoculars. Sometimes I don't recognize. An insect, and I can differentiate whether it's a butterfly or moth antenna. Whereas moth may have feathered antennas, but they never have clubs or hooks. And you can see on this hummingbird clear wing that it's got a straight antenna. And then all of these native plants that we have evolved together. And th that evolution creates an ecosystem that's complex. The more complex, the better it is, the better it is able to resist any changes. So one of the evolutionary things, the Carolina sphinx moth is actually the adult of the tomato hornworm, or actually I think it's the tobacco hornworm, but it's what feeds on tomato plants. Um, and it has evolved to feed on tubular flowers. It has a six inch long tongue, and this is it's feeding on a Dactura. Uh, nectaring on the vector. So let's go back to my glorious failure and just go over these questions. What killed the Baltimore checker spot caterpillars? I already mentioned some wasp. And because those Baltimore checker spots, you know, I thought if I had the host plant, I have the, I could raise a colony of them. No, there's a lot more to an ecosystem and I didn't understand it. What role do caterpillars play in their ecosystem? Well, obviously they're food for many other things, um, but they also, uh, as we mentioned, instill plants to form toxic compounds, which may not work against the particular caterpillar, but work against a whole bunch of other caterpillars. Um, and so there's a balance where the caterpillars feed on the plants, but also the plants respond and are better for it. What would happen if the caterpillar had no predators? Well, it would eat all its hosts, you know, host plant, and then there'd be nothing left for the caterpillars and the whole system would collapse. Are caterpillars ever beneficial to their host plants? Well, we just mentioned that, yes, they induce uh, the plant to form toxins that uh, work on other insects. And are predators ever beneficial to their prey? Well, we mentioned the, uh, the uh, braconid wasp that attacks the tomato hornworm but has uh, imbued the tomato hornworm with some DNA from a virus it carries that prevents uh, the hornworm from falling prey to another virus. Uh, so all, we all only scratch the surface of all these complex interactions. And the other thing about an ecosystem is it's evolving all the time. And it's hard when you do something to an ecosystem, it's often unpredictable what the result's gonna be. And so I'm going to end this talk with another story. 
uh, Raspberry Fields Forever by, brought to you by the Beatles. And uh, this is obviously a pun, but I decided to raise cultivated raspberries and then the, my, my raspberry plants did really well. This was just great. But some of them started drooping just like this. And I had no idea what was going on, but I figured there was some, uh, something eating those, uh, those plants. And it turns out what it is, is the raspberry cane borer. And the raspberry cane borer uh, normally feeds on wild raspberries, but it saw my cultivated raspberries almost in seventh heaven. Well, what they do is they, um, they form, they cut the plant uh, in two places and put an egg in between. And that egg turns into a larva and crawls down the stem, eventually eating the, the stem, and it will get into the ground and overwinter in the ground and then come up as an adult in the uh, spring or early summer and start the cycle all over again. Um, and here's a, a, a mated pair of the raspberry cane boars on the right there. Okay, well, what I've done in my field, by allowing things to grow except for tree seedlings, and I, I, I had dogwoods and native viburnums and, and uh, uh, hawthorns, a, a really diverse uh, ecosystem, it also was a perfect thing for raspberries because what raspberries do is they, as you know, they send up a stalk one year and then in the second year they produce um, fruit. And so they have a head start on all the native plants that start from the ground every year. And I just had a, uh, a profusion of raspberries growing in this field um, and a profusion of raspberry cane borers. So, not being the totally altruistic person I was, um, once I discovered what they were doing to my cultivated raspberries, I looked for every drooping raspberry head in the field and, and cut down the, that, that stem. Um, and then uh, in, the, in the spring, the next spring, I also uh, weed whacked all the, red, the wild raspberries I could find. And I had only two uh, uh, raspberry cane borer stem damage from my cultivated ones the following summer. And it, it only points out what I want is whatever you do is going to cause something to happen. And it's not always predictable what that something is. So how to manage a field to promote diversity. Um, if you want to grow fields, and, and fields are great because it's the border between fields and, and forests that is the most diverse. Well, you have to keep out trees by mowing or pruning. You should mow late in the year, uh, ideally late October, early November, um, allowing the asters and golden rods to set seeds and allowing the insects to complete their life cycle. If you have a big field, save money and time. Uh, consider bush hogging one third of a field every three years, and that'll allow the growth of native shrubs to occur. Uh, have purchase for birds, and that's uh, where the forest helps. And then if you're going to fight battles against invasive plants, <laughs> choose ones that you can win. Uh, do some research on the particular invasives. Uh, I can give a whole nother talk on invasive plants. Uh, uh, but some are not winnable. Uh, some are just so overwhelming. Uh, some are manageable. Uh, but it's important to choose ones that where you won't be frustrated. So in summary, a healthy ecosystem starts with the sun's energy, provides nutrients for a wide variety of organisms. Plants, herbivores, predators, pollinators, microbes, they've all co-evolved, and this causes a complex web of interacting species. And the fact that those species exist, uh, if they're native, means that they've formed an equilibrium in the environment. Exotic plants and animals threaten healthy native ecosystems by disrupting this, this ecological web. And as I mentioned, they evolve over time. So thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have if I can, if you can speak. I know, Cindy, why don't you take over from here and be the moderator? Uh, okay, everybody. Thank you, Roger. That was a great talk. Um, I wish somebody would ask a question so I can see if the raise hand thing works. Does anyone have any questions for Roger?
and actually I can't see it because I, I minimized it. No questions. All right. Okay, well, I have a question. Sure. What do I do about my Japanese beetles? <laughs> yeah, they're tough. <laughs> um, uh, you know, my neighbors uh, uh, last summer commented on how wonderful it was because it was a bad Japanese beetle year. Well, the reason they, uh, they had no Japanese beetles because they were all on my raspberry plants. Um, I picked them off uh, one at a time. Um, if they had a white dot on the back of their head, that's a fly that's a parasitoid on the beetle uh, itself. Um, and uh, if you see that, you shouldn't kill it. Um, so I, I ideally, um, eventually, the fly will become prevalent enough that it'll control the beetle population, the Japanese beetle population. So what does um, this fly look like? It has a white dot on its back? No, that's the egg. It's the egg. So it's on the back of the Japanese these beetles, the kind of the neck uh, part of it. So if you see a Japanese beetle and has a white dot or one or two white dots on the back of its head, it, it's already had uh, a fly attack it and that, that white dot will turn okay. into a, a larva um, and will uh, kill that beetle before it can reproduce. Okay. Um, okay. So anyhow, there are beetle traps that produce a pheromone. Um, and some people use those on their yard, and, and they uh, they do really well at attracting Japanese beetles. But you don't want them anywhere near any of your plants that you want to save because they'll attract Japanese beetles from a long ways away. Right. Uh, so right. the general thought is that they do more harm than good. But I've been tempted to use them um, uh, 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 just to see if I could reduce the population of Japanese beetles. Um, so, yeah, they're an invasive insect. They're not from here, and they're just a great yeah. example of, of what happens when they get in the environment. Okay. Well, Let's again, see. thank you very much. For, You're uh, very welcome. I learned a lot. Um, hope other people did. I did put the um, link to our YouTube channel in the chat bar, and it'll also be available on Facebook. And this webinar will be available hopefully by the weekend if you want to watch it again or have anybody else watch it. So I guess that will conclude the webinar. All right. Thank and, you, Cindy, uh, for, yeah. Thanks for arranging this. Okay. You bet. Bye. Bye.